since so, you made me. Uh... So I'm starting the recording now, Mike. All right. All right. So this is the November 2021 meeting of the New Jersey Woodturners. And our guest tonight and demonstrator extraordinaire is Michael Keyes. Uh, Michael, take it away. All right. Hey, thanks everybody for uh, joining in on this, uh, this demo. Um, thanks for joining me in my shop here and uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, so tonight uh, was, it was uh, asked of me to do a uh, texturing and uh, coloring. So um, I thought I would try to do something a little bit different um, in case you guys have seen this before, because I think I've been doing this demo. I really like doing this demo. So um, I don't mind, I don't mind doing it, but I also don't want, you know, I don't want you folks to get, uh, get bored with seeing whatever it is that I make here. So um, a little bit of what I want to do is to work on uh, this sphere. I just started this sphere, this sphere today. Um, it's basically a couple of bats. Uh, these are burned carved. So it's not the same as burned texturing. And I'm just going to do a little bit of that. And then I'm going to get into uh, the background, all of these open areas like this and in here uh, with some of the beads and some of the other things. Um, and I, I, I don't usually start these things with, a, with a, a complete idea in mind. Okay, so there's going to be bats here. Uh, some of the textures are hopefully are going to kind of remind people of maybe where bats live and things like that. Um, the, the lines that you see coming off of these off the bottoms of the bats here, they're kind of like a, like a flight path. You can see that, you know, where the bats kind of flying around there. And this one's the same thing, a little bit larger bat. And it's just kind of, you know, um, it's going around in uh, little curves and, and swirls. Um, but that's just, it's just a, you know, a, a kind of a project that I work on. I'll show, let me show you some of the things that I have done. And you'll see where where some of this Michael, stuff ends up going. Michael, yes. everybody might not know that you're okay. into, and then, um, into your so other well. hobby. Everybody, please mute yourself. Uh, we we'll just talk a minute about your hobby of. Oh smoking. yeah. So so the reason for the bats. Um, I also am a caver, and so I'm one of those guys down under the rocks in the mud. Got a helmet on. I got coveralls. Two lights on my helmet, a third light around my neck, and spare gear in a backpack, and we will go for hours and hours underground. Um, and, and sometimes we've actually spent uh, more than 50 hours in a cave. We took sleeping bags with us and some food and some little stoves, and we camped in this cave in West Virginia for uh, you know for a couple of say nights, but it's dark the whole time down there. So we've slept a couple of times. Uh, in that 50 hours. And what we were doing there to begin with was actually mapping this cave. So we take in um, a compass, a clinometer. A clinometer uh, measures inclines, it measures uh, vertical angles um, and, and, a, and a tape measure. And then uh, we, we bring in a, a, a sketchbook and something to write with. And we, we take, we used, to, I, I, haven't, I haven't mapped in a while, but we would make a, a pencil drawing of the cave with all the uh, different angles and everything. Uh, now they have, they have these electronic devices. I haven't been on a, on a, on a trip yet where they use these, but they just measure from here to there electronically with a, uh, either infrared or sonic. I'm not really sure what they use, uh, but they, they measure a lot of the cave electronically now. And it, you, I guess they're getting a lot more accurate maps. Anyway, that's, that's, that's where the, the bats come from. <clears throat> Excuse me. But I want to show you what some of the things that, uh, that we make, or that I make here, what we can do with, with some of these textures and colors. I, I color almost everything. I have one here that I thought about coloring, and then I changed my mind. And I'll get to that one, too. That's, actually, let's start with that one. So that's this little box here. <clears throat> And this is, this is pretty much what, what I do. I, I make, you know, some areas that are just burned uh, with a burning pen and then the beads are burnt in. They're actually burnt in with friction. <clears throat> anyway, it's just a little, a little uh, um, holly box. This is not your real pretty white holly. This is the gray holly. 
it's just as solid, but you know, some, some fungus got in there and that was that. So I think I'm actually gonna leave this one just as is, just a, uh, a little um, burnt black fox. Because I haven't made my mind up what color I wanted to, so we just decided that's gonna be that. Um, another box. So they can be a, a color like this. And this is, this is called Big Blue. And it's just a, uh, uh, the same kind of textures that were on this one, uh, very close. The, the teardrop shapes on here are just rounded, almost more like, uh, like a water droplet. And on this one, the, the teardrop shapes are all have, have steps in them. And so it's a different look. And this one was maple. And I kind of like that box. That turned out really nice. Love it. And then there's uh, this, this one here was my, my answer to the pandemic uh, in 2020. <laughs> so this is called the Destroyer of Worlds. And wow. if, you, if you can see it, there's a P, A, N, D, O, R, A, Pandora's Box. And uh, this is a cherry box. And so that one, this was made after, <clears throat> excuse me, after this piece. Let me uh, back up this. Uh, did you make the, did you enter that into the Bucks County uh, pandemic or COVID contest? I did not. Oh, yeah. Okay. I, I, it was, it was bad timing. Okay. I, I, I don't always, I don't always, uh, uh, I'm not always ready for a, uh, uh, an event. Mm -hmm. in time and so i didn't have that one in, i didn't have that one ready in time okay so this one was made for um the nature nurture event that that aaw put on with their uh symposium uh, a couple years ago and so anyway this this one is called uh, um nature nurture are we born to love and do we learn to hate and so if you look at all these faces they're they're kind of happy and content and the farther down you go, well, this one's kind of, this one's sneaking out from behind. And he's a little bit, you can tell he's got uh, mischief on his mind. But at, the farther down we go, there's, here's a sad face, melancholy. This one's kind of angry. That one's just really mad. And this one's just yelling, get off my lawn. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're all different. It's just kind of a, a regression of, of uh, emotions. And, and the, other, the other little uh, uh, amoebas or whatever you want to call them, they're just like single cell organisms. Kind mm -hmm. of a, it, it's kind of a, uh, a, the uh, evolution of man. You know, we start out from, a, you know, a couple of single cells. And as we go through life, we could be, you know, go through all these different uh, uh, things that just beat us down. And then we end up that, that old guy yelling, get off my lawn. <laughs> I love it. I, that's a fantastic piece. So I, I think I think it turned out pretty nice. Yeah. And and whenever I'm working on a piece like that, I always <coughs> start with uh, practice things to work out some of the problems, some of the issues. The original idea for this for this piece came from a drive home from totally turning a couple of years back. And I was listening to the radio and um, the Beatles came on Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And as you may have heard, I don't know that it's ever been proven or was true or not, but they said that that song was written uh, while they were on LSD or something like that. And that's what L Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is LSD. So I'm thinking, what can, I, what can I come up with? What can I make that would be using those letters? And so I'm tooling along and I, I don't know why, but I thought of looking secretly demented or, or looking silently demented. Yeah, I, that's the same thing I thought. That's a weird thing to think. Uh, but anyway, I, so after that, I, I went and I drew up a bunch of really tormented and demented faces. And I put, I put a couple of them on this piece. And they, are, they ended up being a, a bit creepier than I liked. So that's when I decided not to do that. And then mm -hmm. I went with the different the different um, emotions. Are you doing these with your rotary carvers? No, actually, these are all carved with a wood burning pen. Oh, They're all carved with a hot knife. Wow. Okay. Um, 
one or two different one or two different tips. Mm -hmm. And and carving with a hot knife is kind of like working with clay almost. With clay, you can add more material to it. Mm -hmm. uh, with a hot knife, you're just melting the wood back. Mm -hmm. So you're not you're not cutting chips off. You're melting the wood back. And I'm going to show you some of that while working on that back. But anyway, that's that's where this started. And then you can see these these two these two uh, pieces here ended up being really close to what I put on on the the finished piece. And you can see where I I had a bunch of different shapes. And, and I actually had burned textures into each one of these. And the ones I liked, I, I kept. And the ones I didn't like, I just cut them back out again. But, but don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to, to make practice pieces if you want to try something new and you're not quite sure how it's going to work out. Uh, some of you guys are going to know Derek Weideman. He tells me he never works on a practice piece. The idea is there and he just does it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not as sure as that. Mm -hmm. I'm always I'm always trying to perfect what I'm doing, and and the, the practice pieces help do that. Um, so th uh, another another piece here. This is this is in the same line. It's it's beads and teardrop shapes. Um, but this is this is an urn that I made for a uh, a show a while back. Uh, I, it was a website actually. The website was called e Eternal Art, and they were putting this thing together. Some some. Uh, Heinzelman's Funeral Home and the Lehigh League of Arts or something like that. They got together, they put this, this website together and they, they asked three of us, four of us, a metal worker, a glass worker, a potter and a woodworker. Um, and they wanted each of us to put together um, an urn that they could put on their website. And they wanted to change people's perception about death. And they wanted people to think about an urn like this as something you buy for yourself and you enjoy it for as many years as you've got. And then when you're done enjoying it, you end up inside of it. <laughs> I don't know that it took off because I didn't get any calls that they, that they were interested in anything like that. But um, I actually haven't checked out the website myself either. So did you make four of them? Uh, no, I only made one. But, okay. but the, the metal worker made one. The glass worker made one. You know, so, and and they, they all made another one. Okay. So, this one, as you can see, the uh, this one is mostly steps of just a few beads, and this one has got some steps and beads in it. And so this one, <laughs> I thought the name Eternal Flames or Eternal Fire would be a good name for this until I realized that that's probably hell, and who wants to be have their ashes put into hell? So huh? um, maybe that's why it didn't sell. I'm not sure. But anyway, neat project, and and, and the copper work. I, I always enjoy doing the copper work. It's it's not an easy thing to do. I'm not, you know, I'm not really adept at it. Um, I, I know what I want. I figure out how to get what I want and I make that happen, but I'm not a metal worker. So I, I, you know, I just, I have to think about, I have to make things work for me. Can you cut that copper with scissors? No, you know what I do is I, I put the copper between two thin sheets of plywood mm -hmm. and then I cut it on a, on a jigsaw. Ah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. First thing I do is I lay that out with paper. I, I put the paper around there. I draw on what I want. And then I can lay this paper on top of the plywood, tape it down, cut through the two layers of, of plywood and the, and the layer of uh, um, copper. And then hopefully it matches and then it fits. Um, another one here. This is. Oh, 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 hold on. Is, this, so, is that going to be your final resting spot then? The one behind you? You know, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I still got to do I might that. Have I might have to lose a little weight. <laughs> uh, that one's about 150 cubic inches. And average average is 185 to 225. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe or maybe not. Maybe, maybe someone will buy it for their pet. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't, I haven't made one from, I haven't thought about one for myself. Maybe I haven't gotten to the point where I'm ready to do that. I did make one for my father this past year when he passed away. Oh yeah, sorry. To hear uh, that me. was actually a, a square box. Mm -hmm. um, so this is one of my Celtic drinking horns, and the textures on here are some of the things that we could do as well. So this this step pattern, I really like that. It's kind of like overlapping pieces of metal with rivets in that. Um, I, I really like that idea. I, I think it, it uh, you know it just has a really interesting look to it. 
Um, there's the, also the copper on here. And the, the different textures on here, these are mostly done uh, with uh, like branding irons or just the tips of, of a burning pen, of, of different burning pen tips. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so that's, that's that. Is, I'm sorry, is the silver on that, is that paint? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, it's liable to be, I made that a while ago, it's liable to be Gilder's Paste, actually. It's, it's probably what it was, it Baroque Silver Gilder's Paste. That's the uh, project that you and I met when you were doing a, in Lancaster. I oh, is that like right? Four or, five, <clears throat> four or five years ago. I'm just, are they, do they sell well? Uh, the horns, not, not as well as I'd like, no. No? Okay. No. Well, there, there's so much work involved. Right. They're, they get they end up being pretty pretty expensive, so you have to have the right customer at the right time. Right. Uh, I like making them, and and I only have I have two left yet, and I think I've made you know six or eight of them. So I mean they do sell, they just don't sell near as fast as I was hoping they would. Sure. Um, so here's a little vessel that I made with with uh, stone stone shapes coming down the side. Let me uh, go into this other view here. Wow. So that's just a finial lid on there but so it's it's kind of an interesting and not that difficult of a uh, of a carving project um it's just a matter of making these sharp angles in in the work while you're uh uh making you know the little stone shapes mm -hmm. uh when you're doing something like this so you don't get paint out here this all has to get taped off first and then you burn through the tape to make your design the, the heat is going to melt some of the, uh, the glue at the edges where mm -hmm. the edges come together here. And you have to get that off with, a, you know, uh, um, alcohol or something. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, those are some of the ideas that we could do with, with uh, the burn texturing. So on that one, I think that kind of, I would make that either like an emerald green or a gold. Because they look like chunks of uh, like crystal or, or gold. Um, yeah, they they start out blue on the bottom and they tend toward green at the top. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'll uh, the, the emerald is is a good thing and and the gold too for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so <clears throat> one of the things we want to talk about with with texturing is what are the tools that we're going to use. I, I use a lot of and you can see them here a lot of burning pens. And each, you know, when I'm working on a project that's going to have a few different textures in it, I can set up the pens uh, as I need them. I don't have to, I don't normally have to take tips in and take tips out. I just grab another, another hand piece and away we go. Um, uh, so, and then the other, the other tool that we're going to use is our tools, our cup burrs. And the cup burrs, they go anywhere from 15 millimeters down to one millimeter. The really small ones, I don't use unless I'm on a very hard wood. Um, the reason for that is be because it's spinning, if the wood is softer, it just spins, I mean, a millimeter or half a millimeter, maybe it is, it's really small. Um, it just kind of pulls the wood out anyway. So instead, what I do for the really small ones is my burning pen. Now that's probably a millimeter there. That's, that's the, and these I make myself only because I couldn't get anyone to make them for me. So that's a really fine uh, tip on there. So what I, the, the way I make those um, little cup burrs for the burning pen is I, I take a piece of wire i fold it over i hammer i hammer the fold really tight so we, uh, let's see we take a fold like this and just hammer that very tight together after i hammer it tightly together then i hammer on the end to flatten the end out so it's almost square now so it's it's squeezed together this way hammered down that way and the top is almost square I can then take a, a little diamond burr and grind a little divot into the end of that and grind that end into a round, uh, a round shape. 
And so now I've got my own uh, burning pen cup burrs. Here's another one that I've made. Let's see if we can get a look at this one. This is a little bit bigger. Now this one, I actually bought this. This was a ball on the top. This is maybe a little bit easier to do, uh, but I took and ground that ball down um, with a little cup burr in there. It does a couple of things. It, it um, changes the texture. It makes, it makes those cup burrs go a little bit quicker and it changes the, the, the look of the texture. Um, just, just as an example, if we look at this one, so these that are shiny and bigger, they're, they're spun in with, the, uh, um, with friction with the cup burrs. These smaller areas here like this, they end up looking a little darker to begin with um, because they're, they're, they're just a different way of burning them in there. And they end up having a little bit kind of a different texture to them. Let's see. Here you can see it probably a little bit better. This, this side has not been blackened yet. So this side and this side were blackened with India ink. And I'm going to get into that a little bit later too. But you can see this, this area through here. Those are, those are burned in with a burning pen. And the rest of these are burned in with the spinning um, cup burrs. You're going to so show you end up. Right? You end up getting two different kinds of textures, and I like that. It, it really helps. I think it helps the look of it to, uh, you know, to, to give everything a nice contrast. Generally, what I try to do with my textures is I try to make things random. I, I like the randomness of these things. Now, they're not just random. They're, I, and I, I come up with a name for it. It's random with rules. And that just means that there are certain things that I do completely random. You know, I could be doing some of that and then end up with, you know, a dog's face or something. That's, that's just, you know, completely random. So I don't want completely random. I don't want, I don't want a really accurate pattern either. The main reason for, for that is if you're going to do a pattern, let's say you're going to do a, uh, a basket weave pattern or something like that. If the pattern is off, even a little bit, your eye picks that up really fast. If you've ever seen those little uh, um, memes that go around on Facebook and that, you know, a whole bunch of nines and one number eight in there, it's a pattern. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't know about you guys, but in three seconds, that eight is just sticking right out at me. Mm -hmm. And that just tells me that those patterns are, uh, I mean, unless they're, unless they're perfect, they're not right. And you see that. So with random, there's almost no wrong way to do it. Um, at least for me, the way I, the way I end up doing that, I, I think it looks good anyway. Now, with rules, I mean, here's, here's one that's, that's random, but it's also got this, this particular pattern, which is, you know, I mean, some mathematician could put a number to that. Not me, but some mathematician could. And so it's, it's kind of a, you know, a, uh, a, a, a regular kind of a pattern, but everything going along with it is not, it's, it's irregular. This, this side, um, you've got, you know, the, the beads in there and there's some mountains here, but this is just practice for a different piece that I was working on. I needed to figure out how to make mountains. There we go. That might be better. I needed to figure out how to carve some mountains and how to color them. And that's what I came up with. So, all right. Anyway, let's get down to making some smoke and maybe some fire. So we've got this. I want to do a little bit. I just want to show you a little bit about what this, this burn carving looks like. I'm going to start out with a sharp knife. By the way, I make all my own, I make all my own uh, ends or just because, I don't know, I make everything. <laughs> I built my house. I built my garage mm -hmm. and I've just got a disease. I can't, I just can't let somebody else do it. I have to do it anyway. So we're going to turn this on when we're burn carving. We want the knife pretty hot, uh, actually maybe almost as hot as it goes. Um, I don't know. You probably can't see it, but right here is a fan. When I'm carving on my bench over there, I've got a, uh, uh, a dust collector for carving. I, I fitted the, uh, the out, out feed areas on that dust collector with some activated charcoal filters. 
So when I'm burning, this sucks in the smoke and clean air comes out. First time I started doing burning like this with all these beads, I think I had about two feet of smoke from the ceiling down. I have 10 foot ceilings. So by lunchtime, I didn't, rec I didn't recognize it because I was focused here. I was working pretty hard. And I get up at lunchtime and like the whole building is filled with, with smoke. And you know, I never put smoke detectors out here. A couple of reasons. Number one, I'm going to make a lot of smoke out here. and They're always going to be going off. And if, if I had a smoke detector out here while I was in the house, I wouldn't know it was going off. And if there was a fire out here while I'm here, I pretty much ought to know that unless I'm sleeping out here. And that usually doesn't happen. Uh, so I never put smoke detectors in. Uh, but anyway, then after that, I figured, all right, I guess I got to do something to get rid of that smoke. The cup burrs are definitely a very smoky thing, more so than the burning pen, which uh, astounded me in the beginning. All right. So anyway, uh, first thing we're going to want to do. Oh, hey, Michael, Michael, yes. Michael I'm sorry. Uh, you've got all these uh, burners behind you. Are you plugging these in one at a time into the power supply? Uh, well, I have two. I have two power supplies down here, so I have two of them plugged in at one time. Okay. So, uh, but otherwise, yeah, I'm going to pull one out and put one in. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, let's just take a look at that quick. So I've got these blocks of wood with you know holes holes drilled in here, and I got a little hole in the back that just keeps the uh, the plug off the floor. And there, I don't know how many is across there and there's some across here. And I've got more tips than that. You can see I've got some hanging up here there's, and there's some in the drawer here. Um, and, you know, I may end up pulling some out and putting some away. And it really, it kind of just depends. The last mm -hmm. project I was working on, some of these are going to be just, just in here. So I, I, didn't, I didn't put anything specific in today. Well, I did do one or two. Um, so I may end up having to, to change some tips on some of these just because they're not really, uh, they might not be what I needed for this project today. Okay. All right. Yep. Um, I have a detail master down here, uh, which they are out of business. They don't make them anymore. Keep your eye out on eBay or something. I like it. It's a good tool, I thought. Uh, the other, my other unit is actually not meant for, let me get, let me just show that one to you real quick, like. Um, and keep your eye out on, on uh, eBay or, or Amazon, not Amazon. This is another one that they don't make. Actually, it used to be made really close to me. And this is, this is Avalon Concept Corporation Foam Sculpting Detail Station. It's got your dial gauge here. It has a high output, a low output, and your, and your power on and off. And it has a, uh, a, a breaker in the back. It's my favorite tool to use. And so it used to be made in Leesport, which is not far from me. They're out of business too. Um, I, I bought that one. I bought that one at a flea market, not knowing it was actually going to work because it didn't say it was a wood burner. It said it was a, a foam sculpting, but it had to be the same thing. And it ends up really being my favorite tool to use. And I wish I could find more of them. Um, anyway. That's, that's what I'm using. There's, there's coal wood is out there. I've heard that that's good. Uh, burn master. Uh, I, I, have, I have a burn master unit over there. That's a nice unit. It works pretty nice. Uh, that was actually half of it is a, that you could use a, a rotary tool in and the other half you could put a wood burning pan in. I bought that for doing demos when I traveled. I only needed one tool to do two different things. Unfortunately, the 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 carving the carving unit doesn't quite have the power that I would like. It doesn't have quite the torque that I would like. For general things, it works pretty well. But so I don't end up I don't end up taking it with me. I end up using it here in the shop when I have students. Okay. Now, so the first thing we want to do here is to cut in some stop cuts. If you're going to do some carving. Um, we need to do like these outline, outlining cuts, these stop cuts. And I don't know if you can see that knife. It's kind of glowing a little bit red there. So it's pretty hot. This is uh, maple. It's a soft maple. So it doesn't have to be uh, really hot. Um, but we're just going to do these straight in stop cuts. Yeah. 
Did you turn the ball? Uh, I did, yeah. Okay. When I when I do spheres, I end up doing about I don't know ten or twenty of them. I use a, I use a uh, Carter sphere jig. Oh, okay, yeah, I know what that is. Yep. And so when that's set up, I'm like, you know, even though I only need one, right? Um, I'm going to do a few, and they they've been sitting in the shop, and I use them every once in a while. You have a, you do a ball day. <laughs> I do a ball day. Um, I I actually just finished carved three three inch spherical ornaments for um, caver. Uh, one one caver wanted one, and you know I never do just one if it's a small enough project. If it's a big project, I'm not going to do more than one. Um, but uh, anyway. I did three spheres there, and now those spheres were already, they were already turned when I turned this one, and so I didn't have to turn those anymore, but I did have to hollow them. I hollowed them in a, uh, a sphere jig that I learned how to make back in the 80s, I guess, the late 80s. My friend Dave Hardy was, was making spherical ornaments back then, way back then. All right, so that's that's the outlining cuts. Here, I already started to put in some of the details. Now, I'm not going to do the, the face on the other one. It's just a little bit, it's a little too small, a little too tricky, and it's going to bore you guys to death. But I will do a little bit of, of this, um, the, of the wings, just to show you what that looks like. So you can see the face here is, it, it's pretty much done. It needs some eyes yet, but uh, I'll, I'll get that a little bit later. So this, this section of the wing is, is rounded. It's, let's see, I don't know if you can see that. It just, the edges are, are deeper than the center is. Yeah, we'll and that's, you. we're going to do that on this next piece here too. And it's because I've gotten older, this, this uh, uh, visor here is really, really helpful. I'm going to try not to get my head in the way. But so you can see all I'm doing. This is, this is melting the wood away. Oh, it just melts it away. It's it's wow. really cool. I, I resisted doing this. I started out as a as a chisel carver back in 1981, a lot of years ago. So I was carving with knives and chisels, sharp edged things, and I saw um, Jack Vessery and and uh, Derek Weideman carving with the hot knife, and I I just I don't know. It took me a while to get to want to do that. But I'm telling you what, it is a really cool technique. Um, even if you're not a carver, you know, just try, try it yourself. And it doesn't have to be a bat or, or a, a dog or anything like that. It could just be some shapes. Like this is just a triangle. This, this wing here is just a triangle. And you could, you could do that. The one box that I showed earlier that doesn't have any paint on it, the beads on there were, they were carved just exactly like what I'm doing here. Not the beads, the, um, the, uh, uh, the teardrop shapes. I don't know if you saw those little sparks flying off of there, but you do have to get the carbon off of your tool on a fairly regular basis. So there's there's that. That's pretty much what it what this this first one looked like. And once we get to that point, then we're going to want to get the carbon off of there. A couple of ways. So I've got three different brushes here. These two look very close to the same. This is a really soft bristle brush. Uh, it's it's brass, but it's really soft. This one is brass, and it's a bit stiffer. And I had some that were, were way too stiff. Um, the stiff one is fine if you're working on ash or uh, some other really hard wood. Because you, what you don't want is you don't want the, the, the bristles of your brass brush to scratch the surface. So I generally don't use this one unless I'm working on a really hard piece of wood. I'll, I'll use this one almost, almost all the time. And we're just going to brush that carbon off of there, just like that. 
the carbon that gets on there is acts as acts as a uh, an insulator between the wood and the hot knife. If there's too much carbon on there, you'll notice it's going to either burn much slower or not burn at all sometimes. So you want to do that. You want to get the carbon off the knife and off the wood. If you got a really soft wood like my like this basswood, I actually use this this uh, it's a horsehair brush. It's it's kind of a stiff kind of a brush. It doesn't have to be horsehair. It could be a plastic bristle brush. Um, you know, maybe even a toothbrush, a stiff toothbrush, because that that can go over the surface and not leave any marks in the wood. Because this is soft basswood, uh, this one maybe wouldn't. I don't want to take the chance. This one definitely would. That would definitely mar the surface. So we don't want to do that. All right. So that's a little bit of of power. Uh, yeah. Uh, hot knife carving. If you want to see some more of that, we have time later. I'll, I'll do a little bit more of that. So now um, to do some of this other work, I want to start out with some, some beads now. Now I, I had said earlier that I have a uh, random, but with, ran with rules or so random with rules. And what, what some of the rules are that I, I will uh, uh, explain that. I start out with the largest cupper I'm going to use. Now, these cuppers, like I said, they go up to 15 millimeters. The 15 millimeter does work in a micro motor. It works in this one. This is a uh, Oz Plus. But even, even at that, this is as tough a tool as I have as far as the micro motors are concerned. It's, it's a lot of effort to put that big burr into the wood. So I end up using, I end up using a, uh, a Fordham tool, Fordham handpiece, if I'm going to use the really big burrs. I don't use them as often. Mike, when you're so, saying burrs, when you're saying burrs, what are you referring to? Uh, these cup burrs. The cup, the cup burrs, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah the, the, these larger cup burrs, um, they, they take a lot of force. Mm -hmm. So this is 15 millimeters from edge to edge. Oh, this is something that you're going to have to know if you're going to use something like this or any of these cut burrs. Whatever, your, whatever the diameter of the cut burr is, the thickness of your wood has to be more than half of that. Sure. Because this is a half a sphere. Mm -hmm. So if you take 15 millimeters, drive that into the wood to get a full size bead there, it's going to be seven and a half millimeters deep. And if your wood is seven millimeters deep, that means you just drilled a hole. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't put a bead in. You drilled a hole, so you do. You do want to be aware of that. And so, if you you'll notice that some of the boxes that I that I make, they have very thick walls, and that's the reason. Depending on what what cup burrs I'm going to use, I'm going to need a thick wall to be able to do that there. Can you uh, can you zoom in on those cup centers, those cup burrs? Sure, sure. Yeah, to see your collection. Yeah. Okay, so this is 15 down to 10. Yeah. And then we've got um, six, a four, and a two. Uh, there's there's a set that I have that I that I uh, um, that I sell. It's it's a four. Uh, no, it's a 10 millimeter, a six millimeter, a four millimeter, and a two millimeter. And those, those generally are the ones that I use. They're the ones I like the most. They're, they're in a nice range. You know, they end, up being, they end up being what's in this range right here. So we've got, we've got the, uh, you know, the 10 millimeters and the six and the four, two. And then the really small ones I end up doing with, with the wood burning pen. So I'm I'm going to go with the 10 millimeter, and I'm going to do this one with with the front camera on, just because I want to show you kind of what this smoke looks like, and you'll be able to see it in the close up as well. But um, I got the fan blowing here, just kind of blow the smoke over this way away from me, and they spin they spin at anywhere from the really big ones probably around 20,000 up to the really small ones up to 50,000. This 10 millimeter here, I got it at 40,000 right now. 
Um, oh, we have to we have to talk about the uh, the bid itself. Meeting tonight. Now, Promote. I keep forgetting to go and do it. Oh. But here, no, it's on now. It's all right. Is there a question? I can see. I can see what he's doing. I need the sound. It's uh. Put it on. It's Maybe we want to put that one on mute. On mute. I, whoever that I, is. I got Eddie on mute now. All right. Okay. Um. So anyway, when you, when you buy these bits, you can get them from MDI MDI Woodcarver Supply. They are a jeweler's tool. So you could get some of these from um, um, Auto Fry is, is one. The, and the big Rio Grande, that's the one I was trying to think of. They have some. They don't have any of the really large ones. As a matter of fact, the only people that I know have the large ones is MDI Woodcarver Supply. Uh, he's That's uh, Wayne Edmondson from, from Maine. Uh, the smaller ones you can get probably almost anywhere. Um, but when you do get them, the very top of this tool, if, let's, let's zoom in a little bit closer here. So you see those teeth sticking out, right? Now they, they don't stick out like that when you buy these. When you buy these, there's actually a flat surface on this edge. So what you have to do is you have to grind this outside diameter down. Now you see how this is all burnt. I've got one here. This is already ground down. Well, they're all already ground down, but you can see where this, this surface here has been ground on, on a grinder. And you can see the teeth have, have uh, shown up. So when you get these, there are, there are teeth down inside, inside here. You can see them there. Those teeth come all the way up to the lip. They're not meant they're not meant to be put into, uh, into a piece of wood. They're meant to grind off the, the end of a piece of wire or something like that for the jewelers. So when I first started using this, I didn't know that I should grind off the outside edge. And what happened is, is I, as I was trying to use these, I would put them against the surface and that flat edge on there would cause it to skip and not go where I wanted it to. I had to hold it really steady and really tight until it started going in and then it would go in. Um, once I, once I decided and found it or realized that I needed to grind the outside diameter smaller so that those teeth showed up, now they'll go right where you want them. They'll, they, those teeth grab a hold and, and then just allow it to go straight in. It doesn't skip away. So that's something that you're going to want to do if you're going to get those tools and, and do that. You want to start out the way I first saw this happen uh, back in the early 80s. A friend of mine, Julius Hayden Woodcarver, he, on a, on a walking stick, he carved these beautiful clusters of grapes. He carved a grape vine with several clusters of grapes, and they were perfectly rounded grapes. And I'm like, Julius, how did you do that? I said, I'm a pretty good carver, but I couldn't carve those like that. How did you do that? He took a finish nail, like uh, a seven uh, penny finish nail, uh, ground out the end of it with a little diamond burr and drove that into the wood. That was a long time ago, and I hadn't done anything with it since. I thought it was a really cool technique, but I didn't have any ideas of my own. Uh, not until the early 2000s when I started using these. Um, and yeah, so actually the first couple that I have, I, I actually made myself. I, I used uh, finished nails. I took some larger cutting burrs. Let me grab one real quick like to show you what, what they look like. So you can see that was just a uh, just some kind of a cutting burr. Well, I ground the end of it in with a with a uh, diamond burr to get that that little hollow divot there. I did, I ground the outside off a smaller because I didn't need one as large as that. I wanted something a little smaller. And until I realized that there was actually something out there that you could buy, once I realized that once I realized that there's somebody out there making something just like this, I'm like, hey, I can go buy them. Even, even after that, I still had to figure out that, okay, they do need to be ground back a little bit. All right. Anyway, we were going to make some smoke. Let's do that. About 40,000 RPMs. Air is blowing across here. 
when I when I put in the large burrs, I don't put in a lot of them. Now, when you can see that's pretty dark, these actually cut better the uh, the more often that you cut them, the more often that you use them. As soon as this bit gets hot, it goes in better, it goes in quicker. If you don't go in all the way, you're going to have a, a flat spot. Still not all the way. So that's one of the things you got to be aware of. You want to make sure that you go deep enough. So random rule number one is make sure you don't use too many of the larger bits. The other thing is, is we still have to get the carbon out. This is a rotating tool. I didn't realize when I started using these that carbon was going to build up in there. And, and you can tell that it does. The reason I found out or how I found out that it does is it leaves a groove. The, the carbon buildup in there leaves a groove on the bead that you just did. I'm like, how'd that bead get there? How'd that groove get there? What is that? And I looked inside and the carbon actually builds up in there. So I just take the coarse brush and I just run this onto the ends of the, the coarse bristles and then it's good to go. So like I said, uh, the, larger, the larger the cup burr, the fewer of them I put in. So right now I've got four of them. Maybe I'll put one over here. And maybe one, maybe one here. There we go. One of the things we want to be aware of too is that this is going to be hot. So when you go to take it out, don't use your fingers. It will, it will burn you. <laughs> <laughs> you learn that after the first time. <laughs> yeah, guess how I figured that one out, right? <laughs> and you know, any sane man would say, oh yeah, I just burnt that wood. It ought to be hot. Well, I wasn't thinking. Yeah. Bam. That yeah. was yeah, it would it would get you. So then the next size down um is gonna be uh six millimeter. That actually this one actually has a smaller uh a smaller diameter shank. It's a three thirty second shank. Um uh, most of these are gonna be uh eighth inch shank. That one's 332nd, uh, just the way it came, and I don't know why. Uh, so now this is a little bit smaller one. I'm going to put more of these in, and I'm going to start putting them in small clusters, maybe two or three in a spot, and maybe up against the larger one. Now, these are just my arbitrary rules. Came up with them over the years as I've been working on these things, and that's what works for me. If you guys are going to do this, you know, maybe come up with your own arbitrary rules. And, 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 and the, the only thing that arbitrary rules do is they make your work with a, with a sense of continuity to it. So they, like all of these, even though they're random, they all looked kind of the same. So it's, you know, it, it, and, and they all kind of look like Mike's work. And that's hmm. what I like about it. All right, so. We'll go up against this other one with a couple. Now we don't have to be always up against the other ones. We can do a do a small cluster by itself. And I try not to worry about you know exact placement. Because I want it to be random. I want it to be you know, spontaneous. As a matter of fact, I, one, of, one of my, uh, I don't know if I want to call it a rule, but one of the things that I do, if I feel myself being pulled into a particular direction because it's starting to look like a pattern that I like, I, and I recognize that, then I just say left turn in my head. I go left turn and I want to do something else. I don't want it to be patternistic. I want it to be as random as 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 possible and the clusters don't have to be like that they can be like this they could be just just two of them like that 
Um, and they could be by themselves, like I said. They could be, you know, they don't have to be, they don't have to be anything in particular, but they do, they should fit the rules that I, that I place for myself. And that's a little bit bigger cluster. And it doesn't hurt to put one by itself either, especially in a small area like, like that small area there. So you can see what that's doing for me. I, I'm working on the whole piece at one time. That kind of keeps things. That kind of keeps things uh, with a you know in, in, evened out. Even though it's random, it's still evened out. I don't have I don't have a large section with none of these bigger bigger burrs in. There's big burrs in all of that. So that's kind of you know it's kind of a, a way to keep it from being way too random. It, it kind of keeps things evened out for me. All right, so now the next one down. Now that's probably cool enough, and it is. So they do cool fairly quick, but you do have to be careful. All right, that's, that's a, uh, an eighth inch shank. That's a number four. Now with, uh, with this one, I'm gonna go with a um, slightly more in a cluster and more clustered. So, there again, the, you know, the first rule is the bigger they are, the fewer of them. So I'm getting smaller and I'm getting more of them. When you get to these smaller ones, they go in faster. This really isn't a whole lot different in size than the others, but you could see if you wanted to, you could cover a large area fairly quickly with, with yeah. these beads. Yeah, it's going fast, really. I, I kind of like it that I like it for that reason. I am I am inherently impatient. I mean, I'll spend 200 hours on a project, but I'm impatient about it. I want to I want to get it. I want to do it as best and as fast as I can. And I think that that comes from years of being a stonemason. You know, when we were, when I was a stonemason, you had to work and like any, like anybody, any job you work for somebody else, they want you to get your work done as fast as you can and still be good. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I'm after here. I'm trying to be fast and I, but I still want it to be good. I, I still want it to be a decent job. I noticed some of the uh, the six mil, I didn't get deep enough as I'm going around. So I'm gonna have to go back and uh, go over some of those again. I'll point some of them out so you can see what they look like. There's two right there that I just did, that one and that one, that are uh, not deep enough. And there's a difference. The, the one thing that I do like with, with using these is, is these get shiny. Whereas the, uh, the ones that are burned in with a burning pen, they don't get shiny. And I love that textural difference, that contrast in the textures there. Just, I don't know, I like it. All right, so then the next one, the next uh, cup burr is gonna be a two millimeter. And that one I use, I make a trail. Just another, just another arbitrary rules. I don't know why, I like it, that's it. That's the only reason I like it. So 
So this trail connects these clusters. And this actually came about the first time I used these cup burrs. Uh, geez, back in 2008. I think it was 2008. It was towards the, uh, it was in February, towards the end of February. I was working on a vase and I was doing these clusters, just pretty much just like what I'm doing here. But I, with, with this piece, everything is filled in. You know, all of, all of the beads are filled in. I, this one I'm not done yet with yet, but I will get done with that one. Um, but on, the, on this vessel, it was a cluster connected by a line to another cluster. And it fanned out into three different lines or four lines or six lines in the other clusters. And it, that was inspired from a dream, actually. Um, I, I, I don't know why. I was dreaming of, of, of my mother at that time. And she, uh, she had passed away four years earlier at that time, at the end of February. And so this, this piece ended up looking, to me, it looked like the way cancer might go through your body. And that's what, that's what took my mother. And so this very first piece was called Message from Mother. And that's where this whole thing, this, all of this started from, all these textures and beads and things, they all started from that dream. Um, gives me goosebumps thinking about it. So now, like I say, this is where we're going to put um, a trail between all these, all these things. Can you go back to the overhead, Mike? Uh, sure. And I don't want this trail to be directly straight on, or straight lines. I want it to be irregular. So this is definitely one of those places where I might just go left turn. If, I, if I'm coming along on this, this trail here and it's getting too straight, I'm just going to do a, a real hard turn somewhere and, and make it go a different direction. These, these tools are so cool because it goes really fast and gives you such a unique, interesting, how the heck did you do that type of yeah. uh, look. Uh, yeah. these, are, these are just terrific. Uh, Tom Gall is he's in the meeting and Tom uses this technique a lot. And then yeah, this yep. stuff like yours is just great. Is Tom online tonight? Yes, yes, he is. Hello, Tom. Hey Mike. How are you? Thanks for all your help over the years. Oh hey. I'll tell you what, I you know, I've got a uh, I've got a uh, um, a little cabinet in the house with a bunch of turnings in it from other people from, from other people. And one of my favorite pieces, and I tell everybody, is this, this little bowl that I got from Tom. It was about, I don't know, maybe five or six inches in diameter with a sounding board on the top and a, and a little wind-up musical box inside. And, I mean, you guys know Tom, so you know Tom does beautiful work. He doesn't do anything that's not beautiful. Well, this was just gorgeous, and it sounds awesome. It just does. So... One of my favorite pieces, Tom. Thank you for that. Oh, you're quite welcome, sir. Hello, Tom. Don't forget to get the uh, the carbon out. Hey, Mike, just from a time check, we're at 8 o'clock. Okay. All right. So anyway, before we get too many more of those then. How do you tell when you need to take the carbon out? Um, if you see the beads getting a little bit of a divot in them, like a, like a compression, instead of being a nicely rounded dome, it'll go up and have a little bit of a divot. Okay. Circular divot. The carbon is there's a chunk of carbon stuck in that. I mean, it's uh -huh. like I, I, some of you guys have worked on engines, I'm guessing, right? Back in the day when we had to take out the spark plugs, you know, I mean, that thing's going up and down, the piston's going up and down, and the spark plugs are there. Somehow, carbon gets stuck onto the end of the uh, of the uh, spark plugs. 
I don't know how it does that. Same here. I don't know how it gets stuck on there, but it does. I, I would think that the rotational forces would just fly, you know, make it fling out of there, but it don't. It gets stuck every once in a while. Thank you. All right. So um, the next the next size down is going to be uh, a little smaller, and this this ends up being um, some some more clusters. This is going to be more like the grapes, kind of filling in an area. Let's go back to overhead here again. Now, what well, you know what I'm looking at now, a lot of times, I am looking at the negative spaces, the, the spaces that I haven't put any beads in, because the next process is the burning pens. And I want those, these negative spaces to have those burning pen marks. Kind of in an interesting way. And, and you know, in a kind of random way again. But that's just something that, I don't, I don't have a way to tell you what that looks like, what I'm actually looking for. I'm just trying to keep in mind that I want these negative spaces to take up to, to, for, for me to use the, uh, the wood burning pens on there. So I don't want to, I don't want to gather these too close together. I mean, I can, I can connect them here and there, but I still want to have some negative spaces left over. Then the smaller you go, it's a little bit more forgiving. If you go halfway over another bead, um, not as noticeable with this as it would be with the larger ones. And when I get when I get in there with um, the wood burning pen, even there's you're going to you're going to overlap them because they're so small, and you don't notice it. I mean. You could pick those up, the ones that are already done, and look, and you're liable to see it, but not only if you're looking really, really hard. All right, so that's that. I'm going to start with this one. This one is a little bit smaller than what I had just done, but not by a lot. And so you'll notice my hand pieces too. Let's let's take a look at that. I'm going to back that out just a little bit. So on a straight line here, when I make when I make these uh, attach these ends, I attach them at a little bit of an angle like that, so it's not in line with the hand piece. And then my cutters or my my burning tips come off on an angle from that. Yet the reason for that is as I'm burning. Now, let me see, turn this up a little bit more. Um, I hold this handle in this direction. The heat, hot air always rises this direction. So my fingers are out of the way. Uh, I don't get any heat towards my hand. Um, and it just works nicer this way. So this is actually the first time I think that I'm actually using this, this cup burr in particular. Somewhere online on the, on the internet, I found for $4, I don't know, it was 10 or 15 piece, pieces like this. They were all different shapes and all different sizes, and I don't use most of them. But for 4 bucks, I thought, you know what, I'm going to see if I, can, what I, if I can do anything with them. And so these were actually, like I said, little balls, and I ground the end of the ball out so that I could do this. So it was, it was probably worth it. And these are gonna these are gonna get um, carbon built up in them too. So you're gonna make sure you want to get that out. All right. So this is this is probably not small enough. It's not burning near as nicely as the ones that I make for some reason. So we're gonna put this one aside, and I'm gonna get out one of the ones that I made. 
I think it might be a, a, a difference in uh, maybe the amount of of uh, nickel compared to the chromium that's in there. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I'm not a metallurgist. But for some reason, they don't burn quite as nicely. And maybe that's why they're four bucks. But I, I only wasted four dollars to try it. So. And it does work. Maybe I did. I, you know what? Probably the problem is the problem is, I think there's too much metal. There's too much wire between the tip and where it connects to the handpiece. So if I cut this off here and just have that much wire sticking out, probably going to work a lot better. And I'll have to try that and let you guys know. Anyway, this is one that I make. This is just a, a little bit smaller. Let's go a little closer too so you can see that a little better. There we go. And you can see that little white spot right there. I can take this little cutter or this little cup burr here and just kind of burn that right in. Now with the fan blowing, um, this doesn't get as hot as it could. But you can already see the difference between these spun burrs and the, uh, the, the ones that are burnt in with the burning pen. And I like that difference. So this is one of the things, one of the ways to start, you know, like when you're putting, when you're putting beads together, you always end up with these little spots like that and like this, and here's some over here. Uh, they're just hard to get them really close together without overlapping. And so this is where we go in and clean that up. We just make little, little beads out of those. Bump the heat up a little bit. And you can see it's going to go in a lot faster now. Now, right in, in between these four, there's a, a little bit of a, eh, it's kind of hard to see, but a little bit of a tower there where it got missed. So I'm just going to burn that right down to the bottom of those four, those four beads. And so there's a little bead now that's just down in a little bit deeper. Come up next to the bat. Now I generally do all of the uh, the burn carving before I get into any of the textures. So here I didn't do that. I, I started on the bats, um, but I, normally I would finish the bats and then get into the the uh, the textures or uh, whatever whatever the uh, the focus might be here. The focus is the bats. Uh, they might, the focus might be some flowers. Um, it could be, you know, it could be almost anything. The teardrop shapes. And see here going up against the bat, it's just a, it's just a straight line, but that's only because um, I want to be careful not to go over into where the bat is at. So now I'll go back and just do this, the rest of these a bit more random. You know, somehow or another, we got to get next to the bat. And that is a, a, a straight, or not a straight line, but it is a line. And so uh, therefore less random, if you want to put it that way.
Get the carbon off. The teapot that I had made a while back was all beads. And well, there was some copper on it too, but there was no other, no other uh, texture work or carving work on that. And that, that had a really cool effect to it. Just, just the whole surface being, being the beads like that uh, square block that we looked at earlier. And that was a practice piece for that teapot. The reason I like to do the carving first, um, yeah, you might, you might end up uh, changing the shape of the carving uh, and going out into the area where you're gonna put the beads. And so that, that way, uh, you know, you've got, you've got room to do that. And the beads can go anywhere. So they may as well go wherever you're done carving. Um, actually, you know, with these, with these beads, you can do that uh, to make the eyes. So I could take this and put an eye there and an eye there. I probably should go a little bit deeper to catch more of the light. With some paint on that, that'll show up a little bit better. Anyway, so that's that's pretty much the technique that I use for the doing the beads uh, on on a piece. And we did want to get into doing some color, so let's let's think about that. Just over here. Turn the fan off. A little smoky in here. All right. Um, so one of the first things we want to do is to make that black so this is this is all burned well that's not not everything is burned on here but it's burnt uh to a degree um but it's not black and some woods get darker and blacker than others but even even these so these these are not real dark these are darker because this being a harder wood it burnt a little bit harder but even at that if this whole surface was done and all black it wouldn't, it still wouldn't look black like that. You can see the difference. That's black, black, and that is a really dark brown black. Um, and the reason for that, oh, I, I just saw that there too. Um, you can see some of these flat spots on there. That's where I didn't go quite deep enough. I mean, they're easy enough to fix. You just put the cup burr back on there and down you go. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, to get this black, we're going to use India ink. And A pair of <clears throat> a pair of uh, gloves because that stuff gets everywhere. It's water soluble, but still, I may as well put a pair of gloves on to prevent as much of that as I can. Um, you could seal this first, um, and sometimes I'll do that. I'll take uh, workable fixative by Krylon. Um, it's basically the same thing as hairspray. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine, she said, you know, just, just buy hairspray. It's probably cheaper. Mm. Uh, I never bought hairspray in my life. I wouldn't even know where to look for it. <laughs> uh, but I found this at the, at the art supply store. So, um, or the uh, Cryolon workable fixative. Um, so you could do that first. And that's not a bad idea. That keeps the, uh, keeps the grain from rising. Uh, on this piece here, the grain won't, re won't really rise. It's burnt down pretty good. The basswood, let's see if we can zoom in on this side here because this the grain did rise on this a little bit. All right, where's my, my pointer at here? So right here, you can see that that's not really shiny. What happened here was the grain got twisted around while the cupper was spinning. It's twisting the grain because it's a soft wood and it didn't eject the, 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 the wood out of there. So it looked nice and smooth, 
And when I put on the um, India ink, it rose the grain. So basswood is one where normally I would do that. These are practice pieces, so I'm not going to bother. Um, but the ho this holly piece, there's no there's no uh, sealer. Well, there's sealer on it now. But there wasn't sealer on it originally. And you can see how nice and shiny they are. That whole surface is just really got really nice. Um, so the holly doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to uh, raise up. Actually, the only one so far that I've used that does raise up is the basswood. I use basswood for the demos a lot of times just because it's, it's easy to work with. You know, the cup burrs go in easy. The burning goes easy. I don't have to spend a lot of extra time uh, um, working here showing you one little thing. It might be a little bit misleading, and I'm sorry about that. But um, if you're going to work with a harder wood, you know that it cuts harder on the lathe. Um, the cutting tools, a carving knife goes through it harder. The same thing with burning. The same thing with burning. It's going to take... If you're going to use sugar maple, you'll get nice, you get beautiful beads. I mean, they will be perfectly smooth round beads. You're going to work a little harder getting it. And it's going to be worth it in the end. But just so you know that, you know, when I actually, I didn't even work on this today. So you didn't really see how easy this does is to work on, but it is pretty easy. This being the uh, soft maple, not too bad. Uh, box elder, actually, this is a little piece of box elder. It's really one of my favorites to work with. It, it carves beautifully, whether you're using a knife or uh, rotary tools, but it also burns really well, burns beautifully. I, I'm, I'm not one of the guys looking for the really pretty red stuff. If I get it, that's one thing, but I, I, if, if anyone comes across some box elder that doesn't have any red in it, let me know, because I could use it. I like it. All right, anyway, let's put some black on here. Let's shake this up first. So this is a Dick Blick um, India ink. It's a water-based. It does have a little bit of uh, lacquers in, or uh, some kind of a, not really lacquer, but it has some, some kind of a polymer in it. So what I'm using here is a, uh, a kid's toothbrush, you know, a couple dollars. Uh, and this thing never gets washed. When I'm done using it, these bristles are going to be stiff as a rock, like tomorrow. But you just take your thumb and you just flick it a couple of times and like it's plenty soft enough to do this again. And so that's this is all I ever really use, this one brush. And what you want to do is you want to scrub this down into the surface, down all get it down all the way into the uh, um the bottoms of the uh, of the beads. One method that works, which I did once or twice, I did it a couple of times. I don't anymore because it's really, really messy. Um, air hose. Get it on like this here and hit it with an air hose. It gets it down into every pore, but it gets it all over your clothes. It gets it, yeah, don't. Unless you're wearing like a hazmat suit or something, um, just scrub it in. And then when you're done, uh, if, it, if it hasn't gotten into all of the pores or, and all of the, uh, the low areas, well, just do it again. Do it where you need to do it. Scrub it down in there. And all this does is it gives you an even background. I, I, I imagine you could do this with white. I haven't tried that yet. One of these days, I think I will try that. Just, just start out with a white sub-base. Painter out there will probably tell you that's a better way to go because, you know, everybody, most painters start out with a piece of white paper to, to do their painting on. The problem with white is covering up the dark black burn marks might not be too easy. Okay. Put that cap back on there. That's just going to sit like that until tomorrow. And I could work on that surface 
Um, but I'm going to be end up getting black on my hand. So we'll set that aside. And let's see, what do we have? Now we're going to have to work on that. I wasn't paying attention. And I earlier today, I was thinking, oh, good. I have a couple of black surfaces. I can paint on those. Well, and then I decided to do this. and I probably shouldn't have. I'm just going to blot that off a little bit. I don't normally blot it off. I, I normally just let it dry on there. But since I don't want to get it all over me too much, air hose it and dry it. There we go. That'll be good. Perfect. So what I do to color these, and before anyone gets any ideas that I am, I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to colors. I, I, I have ideas. I think I know what I like. Um, I'm not a colorist. I'm not a painter. I do add colors. And I'm sure there's someone out there that is going to do this way better than me. But I do like what I get. I do like the results I get. Um, and I end up with a lot of practice pieces to figure out how to get what I want. Um, so what, we want, what I want to work on today is getting some colors on here. And I think I want to go with Christmas is coming. Let's go with red and green. Why not? So here's a couple of reds, a couple of greens. And when I started doing the coloring on this here, I started with the throwaway foam brushes, the one inch wide foam brushes. And they work great, they do. What, it, what I don't like about those is that my textures end up being a little bit sharp sometimes. I mean, not sharp enough to hurt you or anything like that, but sharp enough that working with the, uh, the brushes, <clears throat> the, with the foam brushes, after a little bit, they start to get torn. <clears throat> Excuse me. I tickled my throat there. Um, it'll start tearing up the brushes and yeah, it's just, it ended up not being worth the effort. Um, it, it does work. And I did that for, for a few years, actually, that way. Now what I do, because I don't know really anything about paint brushes except for what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is something a little bit stiffer. So I go into Michael's or I go into Dick Blick's or, or AC Moore or whatever. And I'm going to grab that brush and I'm going to go, yeah, that one feels stiff. Stiff enough. It feels like how I want it to feel. And that one. And then some of them are going to be thinner or, or softer. I don't want anything too soft because I, I, what I want to do is I want to get this color to go onto the top surfaces of these, of these textures. I don't want it to get too deeply in there. So if you have a soft brush, it's liable to get deeper in. <clears throat> so I'm going to start with this brush. And I did have, what did I do with that? A little lid <clears throat> from a yogurt cup or something. I don't know what. <clears throat> so this, this is half. No, not half. About. 20% Windex or glass cleaner and 80% water. That's my cleaning solution for using uh, these water-based uh, acrylic paints. And that's just clear water to, to do the final rinsing. We're doing dry brushing, so I don't want a wet brush. If I do have to wash this, I got a few brushes out here so I can just trade brushes out. But if I do have to wash one of these so that I could use it again, I'm going to take a paper towel and dry it as best I can before I get another color on there. Because I don't want to get, I don't want wet paint on here yet. I will put some wet paint on later. But right now, I want to go with uh, just um, really dry brushing. Okay, so this is a uh, cadmium red medium. I don't know exactly what that means but I know it looks like that, that kind of red. And there's another one here. This is a naphtha red medium. I'm gonna leave that one out. I don't wanna use that one just yet. And here's a light green. I wanna put that on.
And I'm going to go with a dark green too, a darker green. This is a emerald green. So <clears throat> what we want to do is we want to put a little bit of paint on your brush. Let's let's see that. And let's get let's back that out just a little bit. That's a little too close. And I want to get all of the paint back off, or almost all the paint back off. So that's when we're going to just right on, right on the uh, the paper here. When I when it's just about none coming off anymore, that's when I go over the piece like that. And what I'm doing is I'm I'm scrubbing across the top surfaces and when when we're doing this we're trying to get 20 coats at least of paint so i just did that corner there's two coats on that corner now and if you look at it i mean you can just about see a color on there hardly at all and that's why you're going to need you know 20 coats or so um what you don't want, you could co you could cover it all like right away, but what's going to happen is you're going to fill in the grooves, and then that just doesn't look good. You really don't want to do that. Let's see, does the overhead look any any? You, know, you can start to see there's a line across here. That's where that green's going on. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to work green up to about the middle, and then I'm going to go with red out the other direction. Bit of paint on a little bit of paint off well that just scared me did you guys hear that yes that oh, well. was that was this clamp i had it holding my paper down it just went flying all by itself <laughs> Damn, they made me jump out of my seat. <laughs> oh, and and this is a this is a mistake that I'll I will pull this mistake every so often. Look at all that paint on there. I got distracted by that that thing jumping, and I just about put that up against the work. So don't do that. If you end up getting too much paint on, um, by way of uh, that kind of mistake or something like that, um, take some of the uh, the cleaner that you made up the, the Windex and water cleaner and and soak it right away and daub it off of there with paper towel get it off pretty quick um, and if you can't get it all off then start over again with the India ink just cover everything up and start from scratch get that paint out of the out of the uh, crevices as best you can and just start over been there done that not my favorite uh, mistake to make, but you know, it happens. Okay. So you can make it this way, as subtle it looks as greener as to me. What's that? You can make this as subtle or as dark as you want. Just yeah, by yeah, more, more yeah. Lighter. The more you put on, so I, I'm not going to put on 20 coats here. But what I'll do is after after you get it like that with the dark green, then you take the uh, the lighter green, and because they're both green, I didn't bother cleaning the brush. But if I was going to the red, I would either clean the brush or I'd get a different uh, a different brush out. But you can see where that lighter color then is hitting the high the the highlight highlighting the uh, the upper surfaces, and it's making that stand out a lot nicer. So we'll take and put, you know, a few a few more coats of this up there. At the very end, if you wanted to, um, I'll I'll uh, I'll show you what it looks like to put some white, just some white on the highlights, and and that really picks up the uh, the texture, the details.
Mike, does that uh, paint dry almost instantly? It dries pretty quick because I'm putting it on so thin. Um, if you notice that it's it's not um, working the way you'd like, or maybe s smearing or or something, you might want to let it sit between you know between coats. Um, a lot of times, what I'll end up doing is I will have you know two or three projects going, and I'll put some color on this one. I'll grab another one and put either the same color or whatever color is appropriate for that piece, and then I will uh, you know go back and forth that way. Um, having a heat lamp set up where you can just take this piece, set it under the heat lamp, probably five or, you know, probably a minute or less, bring it back out and you can go right away with it. I generally don't bother with that a whole lot because it's, I am working with a really, really dry brush technique. And, and like, even now that's, that's going to be pretty dry there. You're not going to see any getting off of my finger there. So, um, let's clean this one. And we take paper towel. I'm just going to roll this in that paper towel like that. Try and get as much of that water out of there as I can. Now I can use that one probably right away. It's not as dry as it, as it could be, but it's probably dry enough. But I have other paint brushes here. So let's grab another paint brush. We'll start with the red. Uh, I, I'm liable to put some yellow on top of the red, um, but we'll see. See how, see how I like the red first, just the way it is. So there it is. Get, get all that red back off of there. When you first, when you first start with the color, after you've, after you've gotten it out of here, do it kind of lightly, just in case. Sometimes what will happen is you'll end up with a, a, a little spot of paint, a little drop of paint on the outside where it didn't quite wipe off. But as you work it here, you might have a little bit different angle. It might pull that thicker piece of paint off onto your work. So just in case light touches first, and then when it's not doing anything uh, too severe, just brush a little bit harder until you get it, you know, the, the, uh, the depth you want it. Yeah, this craft paper for the table is really nice to use. You can see the, uh, the green is nice and uh, bright. Red is getting a little bit a little bit brighter, still kind of dark in this area here. So we'll get a little bit more on there. I generally tend not to like just one color surface, like the uh, the big blue back there. Um, you know that that starts out blue on the bottom and ends up going to a light green on the top. I like that better. I like that blending action. Uh, I'm not blending this one so much from the red to the green. It's pretty much just a line down the middle, and that's okay too. It's a different, just a different, uh, you know, a different technique. So I don't know if you were counting how many coats are on there. I wasn't either, but it was a lot. And when I tell you there's 20 coats, I didn't count. But you're gonna, this is not done. This this will take a few more coats yet. And it's it's probably gonna be somewhere around, you know, 20 coats. That's a lot. But it's all very, very thin coats, very, you know, just just dry, uh, dry brushing techniques. All right, so let's clean that one up. Probably wouldn't have to have cleaned that to put the yellow on. But I've got another brush here, so we're going to go with another brush. I think I've got yellow here somewhere. There you go. Let's see. That one. Yeah. 
This one is Hansa Yellow Medium. There again, I don't really know what that means, but it's a nice bright yellow, lemony yellow. So is that acrylic paint? What kind of paint is it? Yeah, it's acrylics. Acrylics. Okay. Yep. And I do know a little bit about color. I know that when I mix yellow and red that I get orange. Um, but what I'm trying to do here, and actually I, I, I am not taking quite as much paint off. Mike, go over it again. I'm actually leaving a little bit of a little bit of uh, thicker paint on here, and I'm going over the the red very lightly. You can see where that where we're picking up just the highlights with those yellows. You see that? We could do that over top of some of the green too. The green, the yellow goes good with green and red. And that kind of helps to blend this together some too. Get some of that yellow on both those surfaces. That wakes those colors up a little bit. So this is, this is a, a softer brush and a, and a much lighter touch. I'm just trying to drag those colors across the surfaces. All right, so the next thing I wanna do is some wet brushing. I had a piece on uh, Wood Symphonies, one of Wood, Wood Symphonies auction, not auctions, um, exhibits. And it, it had, it was blue with gold beads on it. And uh, someone liked that and purchased that. So I guess that meant it was at least somewhat desirable. So we're going to try some gold on here. And we've got iridescent bright gold and iridescent deep fine uh, deep gold. I'm going to go with the bright. These are metallic. So they're, they're a little bit on the shinier side. And so this is going to take... A, a light touch with the visors down and a very small paintbrush. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint some of those beads just by themselves. And you'll see these. Uh, well, should really stand out then. Yeah, this is definitely a, a piece of wood that, that would have uh, benefited from the, uh, the sealant. I don't know that you'll be able to see how, how fuzzy some of these beads are. And they were, they were smooth, but they were only smooth because the fibers were pushed down. And once they got uh, wet, uh, they have decided to push back up again and stand up. But this technique is the same whether uh, you uh, sealed it or not, as far as putting the gold on. It's
it's not as important it doesn't seem to be as important when you're dry brushing, but when you're wet brushing, um, yeah, you notice it a bit more. And it could be too, because I've got my face down here with the, with the uh, visor on and I'm seeing it closer. All right, so you, you get the idea. If you're going to do this, if you're going to you know, have those beads pop out, uh, you really do need to uh, get in there with a little brush and just paint, paint around each one um, as best you can. All right. The next, the next thing I wanted to show was using a, uh, a white highlight. And we kind of highlighted with the yellow a little bit. But highlighting with the white, it's kind of the same, kind of the same technique, just a nice uh, light touch, a softer brush. Just get a little bit on there. And we're gonna take you know some of it off again. This is this is one of those where we don't get we want don't want to take too much off, but we also, you know, we don't want it too heavy either. Because these surfaces are they're you know they're sharp upper surfaces, they, they grab a hole of the paint. And uh, that's how you end up highlighting, highlighting all those, uh, those ridges and things. And you don't have to highlight everything. You can just highlight some areas. I think I want more red back on there. I, I think I'm uh, I'm missing some of the red. I, I I covered up too much of the red, and I'm looking to have some of that put back. And that's that's the thing with with working with something like this here. You can you can go back again. You know, there's there's nothing set in stone. It doesn't have to be one way or another. You can you can change that if you like. See, is this the red that I used or is that the red that I used? I don't think they uh, really look much different. No, I, this is a darker red. I didn't use this one, I used the other one. So the main thing I, I would like you guys to take away from this is, is to get out there and, and try something different, something new, something new for you. Um, that, that's how these things come about for me. It's like I, I get an idea. I'm like, oh, let's try that. And, you know, if, you, if you've got a, a, a pretty piece of wood and you don't want to ruin it, well, get a piece of poplar. Get a, a piece of uh, box elder that you found on the street. Um, you know, whatever. It, you don't have to use your good lumber 
for this kind of work to begin with. We're, we really want something that is a very bland kind of, uh, kind of wood. We want something that's not real pretty because we're just gonna color it anyway. Um, or even if we don't color it, we're just gonna leave it burnt black. It, it, there's no reason to get out there and use you know, your really expensive pretty wood for that. But if you, want to, if you want to do something that's a little bit more creative, you know, try, try these different techniques. Well, it's very easy. I mean, you really make it look very simple to do. <clears throat> you don't, well, need I, lot, don't need a whole lot of tools to do it. The, uh, the, the process is simple. Coming up with something that looks good is your first piece probably won't. My, mm -hmm. Mine weren't, but I could show you a dozen practice pieces that don't look good because, you know, I mean, that's why I practiced that. When I, when I was doing the teapot, I was like, I wanted two different colors. I wanted to fade like this without the highlights. I wanted to fade from one color over to another diagonally across this, this square teapot. And I, I didn't know what was going to work. So I spent, you know, an hour or so putting all these beads all over this block. And, you know, it, it ended up that I really liked, now these are faded now, you know, they're full of dust and whatever else, but I actually really liked going from a yellow green over to a blue green to a red blue to a red. So it's like kind of purple, purple from one corner to green to the other corner and just a nice blending. And, you know, it, it, it wouldn't have happened the first, the first time I did it. Uh, that, that's what this was about. How, what is going to look good? How am I going to do that? And, you know, you, you just try that. Just, just get out there and, and, and try something different. Try something new and, and try, you know, to make, don't be afraid to put some time into a practice piece. If you're going to make a piece that's worth a few thousand dollars, you're going to want to make sure that, you know, it's, it's going to be worth a couple of thousand dollars, not just the amount of time you got into it, but that it looks like it, like, mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, did it well. So um, we've got a couple of minutes yet. Do we have any questions? Anybody want to know or see anything a little bit different? I mean, I could, I could get out a couple of uh, um, branding iron type, type burning tips and show you some, some background, things like that, if you'd like to see that. Yes, um, question. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, earlier on in your demo, you, ha you had your wood burning uh, handpiece. And it looked like it was a detail master handpiece that you removed the tips from and put your own stuff on it. Yes, that's exactly what they were. And the reason they were that, they, uh, they wear out. Here's one here that's, that's ready for my own tips. So the, the tip that was on here, broke. I, I think I actually got this tip, this burning hand piece. At, I, got a, I got a few of them from, I don't know, flea market, a yard sale or something. Some of them had workable tips and some were broken. The guy wanted 10 bucks for the pile of them. I'm like, yeah, I'll take them. So what, what I end up doing then is this, this piece right here is called the terminal strip that and it's it's actually a line of them that is probably you know you've got these these uh screws here it's probably about that long but maybe six inches long and and it would be something that you might have inside of an electric panel box i don't know where they use it um but i use it here and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take that strip and i'm going to cut it cut it two of these wide and these these pieces here are what's inside of the plastic. So you cut the plastic off and you have that's what's left over. So you take a couple of these and you mount it to these. Now this is, these are very close together. So you're gonna need to bend them apart a little bit. Let's see. Well, they're actually not bent, bent apart too much. Um, but you know, the handpiece is there. It, it has a plug on it. 
it was meant for doing what we're doing. And I'm just, I, I, you know, Norris White, some of you guys used to know that, that man. Norris White would say, you know, you just use everything but the squeak and it, pretty much. So I, I just figured, why throw that out? I can make a handpiece out of that. That said, I really do like my wooden ones much better. And the reason I like the wooden ones is they just don't get as hot. The, the aluminum ones, the, you know, this aluminum is going to get hot. And after a while, you're not going to be able to hold it. And I can burn all day long with these wooden ones. Now, you know, they, they, they will get a little bit, a little bit burned on the, on the end. Uh, but I have, I have yet to throw one of these wooden ones out. I never need to throw any out. Um, they just, you know, even, even though they're getting scar scored, uh, they're still working fine. So, and they've been, I've been using them for a bunch of years now. And along with that, Mike, um, you have a detail master. I have one yeah. of those as well. Do you yep. find they get hot enough for that actual uh, like burning or carving with it? Um, well, that's what I was using just today doing working on the bat here. So, yeah, not too bad. The uh, the Avalon tool, I get it does get hotter. So I, I like that better, but it's not available. So, well, neither is the detail master for that matter. I can't really speak to cold wood. The, uh, the burn master that I have, uh, that's fine. I, I, I haven't actually tried that one for carving though. So uh, I, I can't really tell you about that, but for the, uh, for the stamping methods and any uh, of the other wood burning type, it, they, they seem to work fine. Okay, thanks Mike. Yep, yep. All right, so um, some, of the, uh, some of the other tips that we've got. Get rid of that. And we'll put that over here. Bring my sandbag back. Sandbag does two things. It's going to hold this. It's going to hold this. Uh, my work nicely, and also it keeps me centered under the overhead. So I know where the overhead is. Um, let's see. So this tip is just uh, kind of a squiggle, and I call it my uh, soft ice cream. Looks like a potato masher. Yep, it does look like a potato masher. And you see the smoke hanging out here. That means I got to turn the fan on. I try not to have the fan blowing on the uh, the the handpiece, just because it's going to cool it too much. But this is one I like to use when I'm doing a border. I can line them up like this. Now, the one thing that we have to be careful of with these, with these uh, hand pieces is we don't want, where they're bent back and forth, we don't want them to touch anywhere. And this one's looking pretty close, but I don't think it's touching anywhere. Is it, if, if this bend touches the next bend, it creates a shortened uh, um, line for the electricity to go through and it won't get hot all the way around. The, uh, the, the heat will, will take its shortest, easiest route. And these things you can, let me, let me do that again. These, these bits will uh, get carbon built up on them pretty quick. You can see those spark sparkles on there. That's the carbon building up. And some of these are big enough that you have to rock them. You know, you can't just press it right down. You might have to rock it, wiggle it around back and forth, especially on a round surface. You know, a surface like this here, you, you certainly have to rock that kind of back around that rounded surface. Otherwise, you know, this being flat-ish, that being round-ish, it's not gonna, not gonna work. All right, so that's, that's that one. How do you do that caterpillar line on the cylinder? Oh, all right, let's see, this one. 
that is one that I don't have hooked up, but I will hook it up for you. That is actually that's my my bird uh, bit. So let's see. Uh, so he's talking about that. Yeah, and that's that's the same bit that does these birds. Oh. And that bit looks like like that. And I'll, I'll I'll discuss how I how I made that tip while I'm putting it in. So as you can see, let's let's do that one real quick overhead here. It's it's bent like a W in the middle with two wings. Yeah. And that whole surface is sharpened like a knife. So I, I take a, a piece of nichrome wire and I hammer about an inch and a half of it flat. So it's this long in the very center. I'm hammering that flat and then I'm going to sharpen it. I'm going to I'm going to file it flat on one edge and then file it down so it's sharp like a knife. And then the the, the rest of it is bending this thing Let's see, go, like that. Uh, go this way. Um, bending, the bending part is the tricky part about that one because you want it, you want each of the bends to be even and you want them to be sharp. So let's, let's take, see if we can get a better look at this now. So the first bend that I'm, that I'm, you, I make when I do this is this, the center bend right here and then i'm going to do these two bends and so that that whole center section is bent like a w but very very flat mm -hmm. and then i have to i have to heat it i have to anneal it and then i have to spread it open i have to pry it open but each of those bends they have to be the right length so that the bird isn't tilted to one side or something so uh, the first one didn't work out. Second one was not was uh, was this one. So it's not so bad. But yeah, the first one didn't go. And figuring out how to make tips, how to how to get tips to work the way I wanted them to work, was was a trick. I I, I spent eight hours one day um, making eight different bits to do. Um, a bumblebee or, or a yellow jacket, uh, honeybee. I'm sorry, honeybees. And that's that's this set right here. So in here we have the uh, the thorax, the abdomen, and those are twisted. Those are twisted uh, pieces of nichrome wire. And then this one is the head. That's the outline of the head. This is one of the eyes or the eyes. This one, the, the thorax has a, a smooth shield-like thing on its back. So that one makes that. That goes in the middle of this. And then here's a left wing and a right wing or vice versa. And then that's only, that's only seven. The eighth one is actually just a writing tip. And I draw in six legs, two antenna on every one. And some of the some of the projects I did had two hundred bees on them. What I like about that that set of honeybee um, cutters, though, is you can take the thorax and put it here, and then take the abdomen and turn it here, and put the wings closed or the wings open. So it's variable. It's very variable. Which, when you're making, you know, a, a hive of honeybees, you want them. You don't want them to all be exactly the same. Uh, as a matter of fact, doing things like that, research is your biggest friend. And I do a lot of research. When I have a specific project in mind, like that was a teapot that had you know, 200 and some honeybees on it. And what do they look like when they're in a, uh, in a swarm? And... I looked at some swarms, they lined up in rows. They just lined up in straight rows. I didn't like it. I didn't like the way it looked. It just looked too 
I don't know. It, didn't, it looked man-made rather than, even though it was natural because there was a photo of it right there. I, I opted for being more, more random with that. And I think it turned out a lot better personally. All right. So we got this bird, this bird piece. And so we wanted to see how to make that. Here we go. So if I was going to make a bird, I would take this and I would rock it back and forth and there's your bird. To do that, I'm going to, instead of holding it at this angle, I'm going to rotate it up a little bit and not go as deep. Uh. Wow. <laughs> and that's cool. And I, I am a, a very big proponent of opening paint cans with a screwdriver, driving nails in with a wrench. And what I mean by that is using a tool other than the way it was actually meant to be used. This was meant to be birds, but why not make a caterpillar? Yeah. If, I, if it makes a decent caterpillar. Um, here's a, uh, a trilobite. Well, that trilobite was... Actually, that trilobite started out from me trying to make a cup burr from, for, uh, for the wood burning pen. And I came up with this because I, I didn't know how to do it. I mean, no one knew how to do it because no one made one. But I actually talked to, um, I don't know if it was Razor Tip or I, one, of the, one of the companies that makes these. And I says, I need cup burrs that I can use on my wood burning pen. What is that? What does it look like? So I, I sent him a picture of a cup burr. He looked at it for about two weeks and said, oh, I can't do that. I, I think what he meant was he can't make money doing that. And, I, and that's, I get that. I'm okay with that. So, and it just meant I had to make them myself. So I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to go overhead. And, and this, this was like my very first try at making a cup burr because I didn't know how to do it. Um, let me get closer here now. So it's just a it's just a piece of wire it goes out and around. I hammered the center part flat, and then I hammered a, a divot in the end of it. You can just about see it there. And I thought that would might work. Didn't not even a little bit. Didn't work at all. But what it did do is it made trilobites. The way that was <laughs> bent. This is a different one, and I just used that down the center. And so even though it was designed to do something that it couldn't do, it made trilobites really nicely. So um, anyway, I think that's that. I think those uh, textures showed up on there pretty nicely. And uh, you can see the different colors and things. And, you know, I would take more time and I'd add more, more color, more coats of green and red before I did any of the other things. But, you know, I wanted to show you what that looked like, too. So um, I think that's all that I have for tonight. Any other questions? Any other questions from anyone? Yeah. All right, Michael. Cool. Thanks a lot. We always love having you. Well, thank you for having me. You uh, you give lessons at your shop, don't you? I do. I do. Anybody wanted to uh, get some turning or like one on one or one on couple uh, lessons? Mike's only an hour away from Hackettstown. Yep. I usually get over there. It's not a problem. If you folks, if any of you folks are interested in the cup burrs, I have two uh, two sets of four cup burrs um, left, and I also have I have quite a few of the uh, of the bits. Uh, of the, uh, the I make I make a, a set of five wood burning bits, the five that I'd normally use to do some of this stuff. So there's in in here is a uh, there's a coil, uh, and that would that would make um, like basket weaves. Here's a, uh, a a coil in a different direction. There's a writing tip in there. There's a knife, a carving knife in there, um, and there uh, there's five different bits. I don't remember what they all are. There's a writing, yeah, writing tip. Anyway, and then there's there's another extra foot or two of wire that you could use for yourself to um, uh, 
make your own tips there. And, and then this is the set that I have uh, a 10, a six, a four, and a two. I only have two of those left. I, actually, I just, did a, I just did this demo for a group in, in England uh, last weekend. Yeah, last weekend or the weekend before. Anyway, it was a big hit there. And that's how come I only got two of these left. They, they, were, they were really interested in getting them over there. I have two in the house and they're going, one's going to Scotland and one's going to New Zealand. Wow, okay. Yeah. I do have oh. uh, one question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I do have one of your cuppers and okay. once, once I tried using it, I couldn't get it to go straight in. It danced around. Yep. Is that because I, the speed wasn't fast enough? No, I, uh, what, I, what I mentioned earlier today in, in the thing is you have to sharpen them. You have to grind that outside, that outside diameter down. So, so it doesn't have any teeth on it. So those teeth show up, right? If you did, you see inside where there's teeth inside that thing, in the cup bar? Can you? I don't know. Anyway, what you're going to do is you're going to take that in your in your micro motor. Let's see. Yeah, here's you can see the grinder here. So you're going to turn the grinder on. I don't want to grind these now because they're already ground. But what you're going to do is you're going to spin. Your your carving motor against the car the, the grinding wheel right. while they're both spinning, and what that's going to do is that's going to keep that's going to keep the cupper concentric uh, while uh, while you're grinding it down. If uh -huh. you just ground it against a, a diamond burr a, a diamond stone or something, which I, I haven't tried that that might work, but I always grind it up against the grinder. Um, don't use don't use a hand drill like a like a cordless drill. The bearings in there are not good. And what happens then when you when you grind that outside diameter down, because the bearings aren't good, one side of this gets ground way more than the other side. When you go to put it in your hand piece to use it, it just jumps all over the place. Uh -huh. Guess how I know that? <laughs> don't do that. Okay, That's I'll give it. A yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. That should work. That should work for you. If if you still if you're still having like an issue trying to figure out how to get that ground, I have a little video. It's like four seconds long, and it really is just what I just told you. But I, I could I could send it to you. I don't have any. Okay. There, there's no there's no vocals. It's just a picture of this thing spinning on a wheel. Is it on YouTube? Uh, not yet. And I've been told that I have to do that. And and you know one of these days soon. You have I, I to will, do it. I will do a little video and with some with some vocals in there to say, okay, this is how we do it. But it really is pretty simple. Just just spin, thank you. Spin this at top speed. Spin that, and if they if they're the same direction, uh, that's okay. But if they're at the same direction, then just cock this at a little bit of an angle. If they're in different directions, like if that's going down and this is going up, then you can hold it straight on. E either way, I mean, just. If, if they're just in the same direction, it's not going to be as effective. Uh -huh. well, unless, unless you're at an angle. Thanks. And, yeah. You're welcome. Okay, any other questions? We're kind of ready to wrap up. All right, Michael, thanks a lot, as usual. Very interesting. And uh, uh, you know, thanks. But guys, I'm going to send an email out uh, a little bit later on. Uh, dues are going to be due in uh, December and other than that, if you wanna uh, contact me for anything, uh, please do. So we're gonna wrap up the meeting and thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. You're Great Mike. show, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you guys for tuning in. You guys right, have bye. a good Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. likewise. Yep. Very inspirational, have a good night. You're welcome. <laughs>